Well, it, well there's, there were, I had particular aims in terms of how to make it bad. But I was also genuinely trying to create a lecture that, sort of lecture that many of us have, have, have sat in. So, you know, with, with the idea of what I was trying to do genuinely as a, as a lecturer might try to do, but do poorly, um, was to get the students enthused about this author and who was she. Um, especially if some of them maybe didn't like the story as much, maybe if they had some contextual information about Annie Prue, that might give them a way into the text. Um, so that's certainly why I started in that way. And also then tried to go through the, some of the, the sorts of things that many of us do do in a lecture, which is set up ideas to then explore more fully um, in, in a seminar situation, or to plant ideas in students' heads for things they might want to explore more on their own, um, perhaps in an, in an essay context. So, so I was, what I was trying to do was present the sorts of things that we, we do in a lecture, but to you know, have, have perhaps not done um, the, 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 a not very good methodology for doing them. Well, hopefully I was very, I was not successful because I mean that's what I was trying to do. But for instance, in terms of giving lots of background information about Annie Prue, um, perhaps this was interesting for some students um, or, or would be interesting for some students. But the lecture really wasn't the best way of delivering this information to them. I, I was wasting valuable time, uh, precious, you know, the lecture is precious, precious time. Um, that the lecturer has with the students in terms of setting things up. So all of those long quotes that I read about her mother and her grandmother and lying and, and things like that, I, I might have just taken the last sentence about how she thought of herself as a liar and, and, and that was how she got into storytelling. That might have been relevant in the lecture and that might have been a nice sort of segue into the idea of you know, what motivates a writer or, or a theme that you can see developing in a writer. But all that other stuff, and also the stuff about her doing her PhD in history, very easily um, I could have done a handout with that and given it to them at the end of lecture. Um, I could have done a handout and give it, given it to them at the end of the previous uh, seminar as a way to prepare them for the next lecture, or to, you know, just a little tidbit about Annie Prue. I could have used um, the VLE um, and had a little section on the VLE about Annie Prue in which I could have put up those PowerPoints I mentioned at different points during the lecture. Or, or exactly, I could have gotten them to look for this information. And I mean, I think that actually is, is even better um, because much of what I was doing in this lecture um, was spoon feeding them, just delivering, just doing what we call an information dump. And some of the information was perhaps relevant, most of it was irrelevant. a very flat lecture. As you say, all you saw was me and a board and a board pen. Um, the story itself um, exists in many formats. There's a film version. I could have used stills from the film. Um, I could have, as I mentioned, but didn't use, um, I could have used images of the American frontier. I could have used images um, through history of the American frontier, not even necessarily of where the story was set. Um, I could have used interviews, and many interviews on, on the web uh, uh, with Annie Prue. Um, uh, and so the students could have actually heard her voice. Um, you know, there's a way of obviously using PowerPoint. You can have little clips, audio clips and video clips within PowerPoint, so I could have done that. Um, uh, in terms of that lecture space, um, mm -hmm. those, those are the sorts of resources I could have used. What it, um, as I said also, there's a way in which, in terms of preparing students for lecture, or for pre preparing them after this lecture for their seminar, I could have given them specific tasks um, uh, to, to upload um, relevant images or um, audio clips, uh, things that they think were interesting ways of thinking through um, Brokeback Mountain. Um, several years ago, some of our students um, at Early Career Lecturers um, gathered all sorts of um, 
spoofs about Brokeback uh, Mountain, the movie, um, which were really, really interesting um, and could have been used um, when talking about queerness or sexuality um, or homophobia um, when exploring those themes. So for instance, I could have given, divided the class up into themes or just told them to choose a theme and to find some audio-visual clip to put on a collective class of ELE. Again, this would have gotten them involved. Um, I could have, if, I, if it was prior to the lecture, I could have highlighted a few in lecture, brought them into this uh, sharing of information, or it could be something that they did um, after the lecture um, and could then be highlighted um, and referred to in Most, not for most of the oh, most of the stuff that I delivered in this particular lecture um, would have really been more appropriately delivered through other means. Um, and as I've said, it could could have been handouts, could have been um, posted to the VLE. The students themselves could have discovered some of it. And frankly, I think if 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 the students were themselves given some of the responsibility uh, for gathering information about the author or themes. They probably would have come up with even more, with far more interesting things. They would have, they would have um, extended and expanded the uh, scope of what we understood um, of perhaps the the impact of Brokeback Mountain, um, or the uh, the uh, context of, of cowboys and. Um, American masculinities. I mean, there's lots of other, you know, far deeper and richer sorts of resources. You know, when you open it up to 75 or 50 or 100 people, you're going to get um, a lot, a lot more. Well, the thing that was absent from my lecture was the text. Um, I announced the lecture as um, "Family Fame in the American Frontier." Brokeback Mountain wasn't even the title of my lecture. Um, I spent a lot of time talking around the text. At, towards the end of this little um, mini lecture, I talked about themes, I talked about um, imagery, um, but I never actually talked about the text. And so a lecture is a wonderful place to do a demonstration. Um, you know, I was in a uh, you know, biochem demonstration, but I could have demonstrated close reading. Um, I could have done an analysis of the text. I could have brought in um, other analysts of the text as part of my close reading. I could have really sat down and thought about how do I want this lecture to affect the learning that I want to have happen in the, across the module. Is there a particular skill I would like to demonstrate or, or um, review with my students in this class? And of course, close, close reading as an oral exercise, how do we how do we talk about a text and, and analyze it closely? But then, of course, close reading and analysis in terms of writing. So there's a way in which I could I wasted a lot of valuable time doing this other stuff that could have been very effectively used um, to to actually walk students through the sorts of things that they find um, difficult or or just opaque. You know, we tell them to do certain things, but we don't always tell them how to do it. Right. And what, what, um, what, what else could have been done to engage the students if, if you were giving a lecture that way? Well, well several things. I, I, I think really um, clearly stating one's aims and objectives at the beginning of the lecture, reviewing them at the middle of the lecture, and coming back to them at the end is important. Signposting, Signposting. Signposting the lecture is important. Um, in, what you just said, how could I involve them? Well, I could have involved them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a way, in there, there is space within a lecture, if you don't waste it with, with lots of, you know, information dumping, um, to, to ask questions, to elicit um, student participation. This does not, I think some lecturers feel like that is um, relinquishing um, control or perhaps, you know, in, inadvertently impacting their, their, their timing of the lecture, but frankly I think you can, you know, factor in five minutes or seven minutes. So for instance with themes, I, that I could have very easily opened that up um, to students. What, what are some of the key themes? And that would have actually been very important for me going into seminar. Do they understand what I mean when I ask them what the themes are? Have they picked up on what the key themes are? 
Um, are they leaning in one direction? Are all of them talking about just one aspect of it? Um, you know, so it would have been able, I would have been able to do a little um, diagnostic uh, questioning, as it were. And at the same time, providing a little variety in, in, in the hour, um, in the sense that it wasn't always my voice. And I think that's how question, uh, involving them in questions or using audiovisual. The other thing, of course, is I could get them to find parts of, of the text. I could divide them up again for five minutes, maybe seven minutes, and then have them work in partners um, in the lecture, so that because not everybody's going to want to put their hand up in a, in a lecture. And they could talk with, with each other about an idea in the text. And again, that would perhaps prepare them for the next part of the lecture I was about to give, or consolidate the, the section of the lecture that I had just given. So those are, those are some those are some possibilities of invo literally involving the students in that lecture. And that means they're not sitting there passively. Well, there is a stereotypical you know, idea of the lecture, you know, where the, the, the great mind is holding forth. Um, and I think some students definitely do come with that expectation, and, and they also have a um, they, they make a very clear distinction that seminars where they talk, lectures where they're talked at. Um, and this varies. Not all students feel this way. I mean, I think lecturers also have um, some stereotypes of students, you know, that they're going to sit there and text the whole time. They're not really listening. They're not really taking notes. Um, or they're just sort of staring blankly at you. You don't really get a lot of sense of, you know, whether they're with you or not. Um, and so I, th I think a good strategy, a sort of good practice strategy, is, is um, going, in, you know, mediating a line between those, those, those extremes. Um, I think, again, what it, it, a lecture has to start on time, has to have a clear objective and focus, has to be led by the lecturer. Um, but I, I do think that there's quite a lot of scope within that according to the comfort a level of the lecturer and perhaps the experience of the lecture to open up um, in small batches. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so in that sense, there, there is, um, uh, I'm not suggesting turning the lecture into a seminar mm -hmm. because you certainly wouldn't want to turn the seminar space into a lecture. But I do think involving students a little bit more has mutually beneficial um, outcomes in terms of you being able, again, to have a diagnostic sense of where your students are in that hour, um, and also then, therefore, adjusting and being able to reinforce or go over a point as necessary. And as with that, you started by asking me, how, do, how would you manage student expectations of a lecture? If you start gradually, you know, if you start at the beginning of a term, asking one or two questions, letting them know that you will ask questions. Always letting them know. Don't, don't drop a question in the middle of the lecture with no preparation. But they'll get used to it. They'll get used to it. They'll be prepared for it. And of course, you can do that. You can give them questions ahead of time to think about, or you can give them an idea to think about before the lecture as preparation for the lecture. And I think that, again, you are, um, you are acclimatizing them to, to your particular teaching style and that they will always appreciate that, those sorts of things being signposted as well, so that they know what to expect. Well, I was deliberately um, sort of, you know, playing with my hair. I was um, reading from my paper, not necessarily making eye contact um, as much as, as, I, as I would necessarily. I think eye contact in a lecture, you know, in, of course this depends on if you're in a huge lecture hall or if it's a lecture of, you know, 40 or 50 students. Um, I had my back to my students very often. These are all examples of bad practice. Um, you know, if you have a lot of hair um, or if you have a tendency to, to fiddle with your face or with your glasses, these are the sorts of things that you should try to, I think, train yourself out of because they're distracting, you know, so you can easily, I could easily put a hair clip here um, and I could have, um, I, I could have um, uh, filmed, I could have, if, if, if I'm very nervous and I think a lot of times 
um, um, new lecturers particularly are very, very nervous about going up in front of um, a group of people and performing for an hour. So filming yourself, something, something like just getting, you know, a friend to, and practicing. Filming yourself to see what your, your tics and twitches are, because sometimes they're very, very unconscious. I mean, I know probably lots of um, lecturers sit in seminar and they have their students doing this, or maybe they do this, you know, with their pens and, you know, they, and they don't know, you can't, you know, they don't know that they're doing it, you don't know that you're doing it. So filming yourself even for 10 or 15 minutes, practicing your lectures, um, definitely practicing if you're using things like PowerPoint um, so that you feel comfortable with the technology, that you've got the timing right. Um, think about what you're putting on the board. Um, do, does this all need to be, you know, if you're actually writing on the board because you may, maybe you're working in a place that you don't have the technological apparatus to, to do things like PowerPoint. Is it really a good use of your lecture time to spend a lot of it writing things down? Could that be done ahead of time and put onto a handout? and perhaps posted to the VLE or literally given as a handout at the end of lecture. These sorts of things I was trying to do deliberately and at the end, you know, my back and all that, this is inappropriate for a lecture. You just, you just grin and bear it and obviously, you know, I, I took a sip of water and my, my bottle was very noisy. You can have a glass of water, you can, you, can, you can figure these things out. These are the sorts of things that if you're less confident, could perhaps elicit laughter or a sniggers, and that could really throw you. Um, but it also obviously could undermine um, your authority, and you are in a position of authority when you're sitting, when you're standing, um, and holding forth in a lecture. So it's those sorts of things. Being comfortable in what you wear. Um, these might sound like minor things, um, but I think anything that's going to boost your own confidence. Um, and make you feel um, more secure and more in control um, will actually allow you to be more relaxed and um, natural in your, in your delivery and that will only be beneficial to your students. Well, all of the things I just mentioned um, we'll sort of automatically get more savvy about because the minute we think we're being recorded, um, other than when we're recording a deliberately bad lecture, we sort of straighten up a bit and, you know, fix the hair and um, think about, you know, if things are as they should be visually, um, but also orally. Am I speaking clearly? Am I, you know, speaking down into my chest this way? Um, so so that, would, that would be interesting in terms of the knock-on effect um, that, um, in terms of the knock-on effect that uh, uh, we were just checking that my microphone was on. This is the sort of thing that will become um, second nature. Um, we'll probably walk around mic'd up all the time. I, 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 think, I think it's only a good thing, I mean, certainly for universities, to be able to have their, their lectures um, podcast. It is um, good for the outward facing, good for the outward facing aspects of the university, but also for different types of student learners. I think this is the key benefit of, of, of filming and podcasting lectures. Um, they have the chance to, to see them again. They have the chance to sit and listen to the lecture as opposed to sort of frantically writing down notes and, and not necessarily knowing if they're capturing the right information in the lecture. They can absorb the lecture and then review the lecture if it's available to them um, as a podcast. So I think that's only a good thing.